Hello everyone, thanks for joining nice and early. Attendees are still logging into the webinar, so we're just gonna give them one more minute to pick up calendar reminders and invites, and then we'll get going. So hi everyone and welcome to today's webinar, how e-commerce providers can remove account takeover from their cart. I'm Matt Ingman, I'm part of the European marketing team here at iVation and I'm really looking forward to showing you what we have to offer today. Um, I'll try and keep the housekeeping nice and short. So all attendees are muted, but you do have the ability to answer, ask questions using the Q&A support button on the bottom of the slides. It's the fourth icon with the quote image. Um, and once you click on it, a window opens to the right of the slides. Simply type in your question and click submit. Um, and if time permits, we'll do a Q&A at the end of the presentation and take as many questions as we have time for. All the questions are anonymous, so please feel to fire away and we'll try and get as many in as we can. Um, you also have the opportunity to access handouts during the presentation. So if you click on the third icon with the paper image, um, a handout window opens with the links to corresponding content. Our speakers will reference handouts throughout the webinar, so these will be very handy. Be on the lookout for a couple of polls during the presentation. Uh, and lastly, the webinar is being recorded. We'll be sending out a link to all the, to the on-demand version of this webinar and link to all the slides within the next few days. So feel free to share this with others you're not able to send or if you're prepping for meetings in the future. Uh, today's webinar is gonna be pre presented by Angie White, our product marketing manager here at Iovation. So without further ado, I'll hand you over. Great, thank you so much, Matt. Um, I'm very excited to be here today to talk to all of you. Um, you know, this is a topic that um, we've been interested in for a very long time. ATO, um, is, you know, it's a problem that's prevalent across um, pretty much every industry. And it's something that we've seen um, grow rapidly in the um, previous year, two years. Um, so I'm excited today to talk to you a little more about what we're seeing. Before we do that, let's just level set on what the definition of um, account takeover or ATO is. Um, so account takeover is when a known good customer's account is breached for the purposes of committing fraud. Uh, account takeover, as I said before, is not a new phenomenon. Um, this is something that uh, banks, credit issuers, even gaming sites have been dealing with for years but it's historically hasn't been much of a problem for e-commerce until recently. Um, so when we were looking at it, we were actually hearing from a number of our uh, retail clients that they were seeing an uptick in ATO attacks. So we went and we looked at our own data. So these this, this uh, graph here is depicting um, re reports of account takeover from our own clients. And what we saw was from August 2017 to August 2018, there was a 220% increase uh, in account takeover. So we started digging into this a little more. Um, but first, let's do a quick little poll. So let's see, how large of an ATO problem do you feel like your organization has? So if everybody could take a quick second to fill out our little uh, poll here. Um, you know, let us know if you feel like it's not a problem at all for your organization, it's a small problem, um, maybe a moderate problem, but increasing a large problem or not sure, or maybe don't have enough insight. And I'll give just a few seconds so everybody can respond and then we'll get to see our live results here in just a moment. Mm -hmm. 
All right, checking out our results here. Um, so it looks like um, the majority, 60%, said that it was a moderate to increasing problem um, with another 30% not being sure, not maybe having enough insight. So um, that's interesting. So that, that, that lines up with, you know, like what we're seeing with our clients, what we're hearing in the marketplace. So now kind of digging into why we're seeing this increase in account takeover. Um, a big piece of this is that um, historically, a lot of um, e-commerce sites uh, offer guest checkout. And that was a primary mode where um, purchases were made. Now, with the advent of persistent accounts and um, the adoption of dedicated mobile apps, it's created a new channel for fraudsters. So, you know, before there wasn't an account to take over, right? Um, but now that we have these persistent accounts for users, uh, it creates um, a target. You know, but there's definitely a lot of benefits here. So, this one is uh, this study, it was looking at e commerce. Um, transactions for e-commerce retailers that had both a mobile web presence and a dedicated app. And as you can see, they were seeing, you know, 44% of uh, their transactions come from in-app, 23% uh, from mobile web. So about two thirds of their transaction were coming through mobile channels um, between their app and the, the mobile web. Um, I think the really interesting thing here, though, is that you, uh, the, the, the study found that there was a three times higher conversion rate um, for mobile apps than for mobile web. So you, you were seeing that, you know, the conversion rates are much higher uh, for dedicated apps than they are for mobile web, which is obviously why a lot of retailers are moving to that model of adopting um, dedicated apps. Looking at some of the impacts of ATO on e-commerce, um, of course, there's the obvious ones, such as uh, cost of lost goods and chargebacks. But there's also damage to customer relationships, loss of brand reputation. And I, I find this one really interesting, too, because we're, we're in an interesting age where, you know, they used to say that um, for every good customer interaction, a customer would tell two people and for every bad customer interaction, they would tell 10 people. Well, that's really magnified now in, in the age of social media. You know, they don't tell 10 people. They go on Twitter and they go on Facebook and they go on LinkedIn and they complain about it. And they're able to tell their, their whole network. And, and those um, tweets or shares are able to be shared out even further. So um, a bad customer incident can cause a lot of damage to your, uh, to your brand reputation pretty quickly. And then the other piece to consider is regulatory non-compliance. Um, you know, if an account is taken over, that's a breach of personal data. Um, so that would put you in non-compliance with, say, the GDPR and other privacy regulations that you're seeing come into adoption around the world. So looking at this uh, through the lens of not just as a business problem, but this, this is also a customer experience problem. Um, so some of the business impacts we see, uh, the cost of account takeover, this was across all industries. It reached uh, $5.1 billion in 2017. Um, you're also seeing, I, I think this is um, very significant for e-commerce, uh, false declines are valued at $118 billion per year. So that's good business that was turned away um, because you were trying to prevent fraud. Um, and I think that that's too, you know, part of our philosophy is that you really have to consider the holistic customer experience. So we generally see that um, fraudulent transactions make up about 1% of a business's transactions. So that means that 99% of your transactions are from good customers. So how do you not degrade that experience? Um, for your good customers and how do you not turn away good transactions. So that's just as important as being able to stop account takeover, being able to stop fraud. So looking at some of the customer impacts, you see that 
on average, a consumer spends 16 hours resolving ish issues after their account is taken over. Um, I don't know about any of you, but I don't have an extra 16 hours. <laughs> so you, as you can imagine, this is a pretty big driver of customer dissatisfaction, uh, which is surprising, which, which is why it isn't surprising that 44% of shoppers say they would never buy again from a retailer after a data breach. Um, you know, I think this really kind of goes to um, the idea that, you know, that that trust with customers is kind of precarious. And so that's important to trust or to protect. Some of the attack methods that we see for account takeover. Um, credential stuffing is definitely um, a big one. This is where you see uh, with all the, the breaches in the last decade, there's millions of stolen username and passwords, personal data that's available on the dark web for pennies. So what fraudsters do is they, they go and they buy batch files and then they um, test those uh, credentials against your system to see which ones will work. Um, and then they go into the ones that they can access and they take over the account. Uh, malware, bots, spyware. An interesting case that we saw with bots recently is um, fraudsters would t use bots to attack a service and while um, the business was distracted defending against the bots, then they would go in and perpetrate other types of fraud such as taking over accounts. Social engineering, this is one, um, I actually have a case study a little later that I'm gonna talk about this a little more, but um, this can take a couple of flavors. It could be either you know, going on the internet and getting any publicly available information about somebody. I mean, think about how much information your grandma might put out on Facebook, you know? She, she might put all her, her relatives, her name, the high school she went to, um, you know? So from that, fraudsters can go and see, oh, what's your mother's maiden name? Uh, what high school did you go to? Oh, now I can look up what your high school mascot was. Um, so it's, it's amazing the amount of information that consumers are freely putting out into the public sphere. And fraudsters definitely take note of that and definitely take advantage of that. Um, so then they use that data that they gather to generally go through your call center, impersonate that victim and take over their account that way. Uh, phishing attacks, we've all seen these where you get an email that looks very legitimate from a, a company that you traditionally work with and they get you to click on a nefarious link. SIM swapping, this is one that we've seen um, increasing in the last couple of years. This is where uh, they call into usually a wireless provider and they get them, not a wireless provider, um, wireless carrier, and then they um, get them to do the SIM swap so that they can uh, intercept SMS messages or OTP passwords. So as you can see, um, I've, I found this really interesting. Um, it's, it's not often that you see such a direct correlation, but um, with the number of data breaches that have gone up over the last uh, decade, um, you've seen a direct correlation in consumer complaints about ID theft and fraud. So this absolutely makes sense. You know, as uh, consumers' data has been uh, compromised and put out on the, the dark web, you're seeing an increase in those complaints. Some of the symptoms of an ATO attack that we look for, um, use of VPN or, or proxy servers. So this is basically um, a fraudster trying to mask their location, trying to mask where they're coming from. They might even try to mask uh, what device they're using. Uh, using an older browser or operating system, um, geolocation mismatches. So this could be, you know, um, we see that the stated IP address looks like it's coming from, uh, you know, the UK, but then we, we, we look at the true IP address, we see that it's actually coming from Kazakhstan. So those type of mismatches are a flag. Um, a high velocity of login attempts from one, one device um, so if you see one device that's making, you know, 
multiple login attempts on the same account, or you could see too that that one device is making um, hundreds of login attempts on multiple multiple accounts. You know, that's not a normal consumer behavior. Um, that's uh, an indication that there might be a bot or um, another type of uh, mechanism being used to try to infiltrate accounts. Uh, changing account details. Um, so this is a common tactic by fraudsters. They get into an account, they go in and they change account details such as ship to address. Um, so they can uh, then take over an account and intercept any type of um, merchandise. Now looking at the uh, real cost of an ATO attack. So this was, um, this was actually a case with one of our customers. It was a gaming site. Um, but I think it's, it's really interesting to kind of look through the anatomy of an ATO attack. So what they found is they were launching a new game and they found uh, one device that had registered 2,500 accounts. So again, what we were talking about before with those velocities, that's not a normal consumer behavior to set up 2,500 accounts. Um, so with that intelligence, they were able to stop those accounts being taken over. But they looked at what would have been the cost to them if those accounts had been taken over. Um, so their estimate was that it would have taken 5,000 man hours to repair the damage to those accounts, get them back to a normal state. Um, that would have correlated to $75,000 in wages, $5,000 in chargebacks, and who knows how much brand damage that would have done if they had you know, damaged the relationship with 2,500 accounts. So what's the solution? Um, let's dig in here a little bit. You know, what I talked about before a little earlier, um, I think it's really important to be able to balance the needs of customer experience and security. Um, you know, that's definitely our mantra here at iOvation. You know, how do we protect businesses in a way that's not going to degrade the customer experience? Um, and that's not gonna turn away good customers. So really looking at it from um, a product side or a customer experience side, um, looking at how you can reduce overall friction, increase the customer experience, provide more media access, um, you know, these are all things that you're, you want to put as few obstacles in place as possible so that you don't drive up cart abandonments or um, impact your revenue growth. Now, on the security side, um, you know, some things to look at are, you know, reducing your overall attack surface, you know, getting rid of those uh, central stores of credentials that can be a target for fraudsters. Um, providing a higher level of assurance for your customers and for your business. Um, and then looking at real-time threat and risk indicators so that you can um, do risk-appropriate authentication rather than you know, treating all of your customers like criminals. All right, so we got another little poll here. So what is your top concern in implementing a solution to combat ATO? Is it not adding customer friction, increased security for customer accounts, a solution that's compa compatible with existing infrastructure, or increasing overall fraud catch. So I'll give us about 10 seconds here, let everybody respond to the poll, and then we'll see our live results here in just a few minutes. Not a few minutes, a few seconds. <laughs> All right, so looking at our results here, we see that um, not adding customer friction is definitely the top there with 44%. Um, and then of course, increasing overall fraud catch, 22%. Compatible with existing infrastructure, looks like we came in at 22% there too. Um, so that's interesting. So we, we are seeing you know, this need um, I think this kind of goes back to what I was saying, this need to balance the two needs, right? Um, 
being able to provide that higher level of security, higher level of assurance, while also you know, protecting the buyer journey. Um, and we all know that customers are very sensitive to any added friction. So this was just a study by Baymerd where they found that um, they estimate that 28% of carts were abandoned because of a checkout process that was too long or complicated. Um, I don't think that really comes as a, a surprise to anybody on the phone here. Um, but I thought this was very interesting. So um, what this study did is it looked at conversion rates for e-commerce sites. So for the median, they found the average conversion rate was 2.35%. For the tw top 25% of retailers, that conversion rate more than doubled to 5.31%. And then for the top 10% of, of um, e-commerce sites, that conversion rate more than doubled again to 11.45%. So you can see, you know, this is definitely a co competitive differentiator, being able to provide that streamlined um, buyer journey, being able to make sure that your, your customers can easily navigate your site, easily navigate your checkout process um, is very important in being able to optimize your sales. So going back to this, uh, the, the original question, right? So what do you do about it? What do you do about it, ATO? Well, in a well-designed system, you can incorporate risk signals to tailor the level of authentication to the riskiness of the transaction. So for, for instance, if you have a customer that comes in, they log into their account and they wanna just look at past orders. Um, and you can see that this is a device that they've used before. That's not a very risky transaction. Um, as opposed to, um, a customer who has recently set up an account um, comes from a new device and they want to make a thousand dollar purchase on your site. That's a much riskier transaction. So really being able to look at risk signals and um, apply the right level of authentication based on risk insight is how you're going to be able to create that differentiated customer experience um, and really take friction out of your process. Uh, one of the ways you can do that is with device-based authentication. So um, I'm sure most of you have seen some flavor of this where like maybe you have like a login, uh, a username and password, and then underneath that, there's like a checkbox to say, remember my device. So basically what device-based authentication does is when a customer logs into your site, they can um, register that device so that it's then paired with their account. And they can do that with multiple devices. So they could do it with their laptop, with their smartphone, with their home desktop computer. Um, then what this risk pairing, uh, what the account pairing does is you have the device paired and you can do that risk evaluation in the background. So then when a customer returns, you can look and say, um, you know, is this a returning device that was already registered with us? If so, were there any risk signals such as uh, geolocation mismatch, um, using a Tor network, trying to evade detection? Um, so if it's a match, you can grant access. If you see risk signals, then you can step up to another mode of authentication. So this allows you to only step up in those cases where um, it's risk appropriate. After the step up, if it authenticates, then you can go ahead and register that device and access is granted. Um, if you still see in those um, risk signals or maybe they don't pass the authentication, then you can stop that transaction um, and shut down any type of potential fraud. So I, I thought it would be interesting to look at this in a, a real case scenario. So we had um, one of our customers, um, they're uh, a large telecom and they were seeing a lot of um, 
fraud, a lot of account takeover on their their retail site. So I felt like this would be really pertinent to walk through this example with you guys. Um, so what they were seeing is uh, social engineering attacks through dating sites. So uh, fraudsters were going on to uh, dating sites, ingratiating themselves with lonely people, um, asking them to add them to their um, service, their cell service, um, so that they could uh, presumably, you know, have more communication with them and talk to them. Well, what the fraudsters did is they would then, you know, go into the account, add, you know, five, six new lines of service, order uh, expensive phones on each of those lines, have them shipped to them, and then, um, you know, completely bounce out. You know, so this was costing the business thousands in lost merchandise for each one of these attacks. Uh, there were payment chargebacks, lost revenue from service cancellations, but it also created a bigger problem because uh, their first attempt at an authentication solution uh, introduced too much friction. Um, so it had the unintended consequence of um, dramatically increasing their call center volume and complaints from customers. So. Uh, customers were having to do all these resets um, with their authentication, and it was driving a lot of customer dissatisfaction. Um, so they implemented uh, device-based authentication. Um, they were able to virtually stop account takeover um, at multiple risk points, so login, change account details, call center. And then you know, this improved the, the login experience for, you know, all customers and decreased the uh, volume of complaints that they were, were seeing. And then, you know, importantly, it also reduced their call center volume because you know, they were getting fewer of those uh, manual resets that were having to happen. Oh, and I should, um, Matt's going to ding me. So my... Uh, there's a little button here at the bottom for handouts. So if, if you're interested in that case study, if you click on the um, handouts button, we have the link in there for the full um, case study. So, you know, feel free to check that out. It, it was a pretty interesting one. Um, all right, so just looking at some of the uh, benefits of device-based authentication. You know, like I said before, the, it really does provide this transparent, frictionless access, um, lowers those barriers for good users. So, you know, if you see a, a, a returning device that's registered to account with no risk indications, you can, you know, flag them through with um, no impact to your customer. It provides context and risk. Um, so, you know, while you're doing that a pairing, but it, it also provides you with the context to understand um, what the risk signals might be. So you could either step up or, you know, challenge the customer to pair a new device. And it's also adaptive and dynamic. So, you know, you can use this to deliver the right level of assurance at the right time. So if you do need to step up, so you can use um, uh, mobile multi-factor authentication either as a, a primary mode of authentication or as a step up. And what this does is it um, replaces older authentication modes um, that create a lot of customer friction, such as username and password. Um, you know, we've all seen this, you know, you go to set up a, a password and you have to, um, you know, provide eight to 25 characters, one number, a capital letter, a lowercase number, a special character, a partridge in a pear tree. I'm just kidding about that last one, but you get my point. You know, it creates a lot of friction. Um, you know, we've attempted to make passwords more secure by making them more complex, but um, unfortunately that just had the uh, side effect of making it harder for consumers. It creates friction for them. Um, and it, also makes it more insecure because customers can't remember those passwords. So they use the same one for every site. Um, sorry, that's my own personal soapbox there. So, but with mobile multi-factor authentication, what you can do is um, 
MFA is defined as using two or more factors of authentication defined as a, a knowledge factor, so something you know. That could be uh, a pin code, a circle code. Um, in legacy systems, that was passwords. Uh, possession factor, something you have. So that could be the device itself, being able to do that device registration. Um, that could also be uh, Bluetooth proximity. So you could use your Apple Watch, Fitbit um, as a mode of authentication. So that's, that would be a passive authentication. And then inherence, something you are. So think biometrics there. So facial recognition, thumbprint. Um, and with this, you can um, either leave it up to the consumer, so allow them to choose the mode of authentication that they want to use, or the admin could decide, you know, we want to um, allow, you know, fingerprint scan, pin code, and circle code, and maybe you don't offer the other ones. Um, but what that really does is if, you know, you can offer um, choices to consumers, it creates buy-in because, you know, then they're able to choose the mode of authentication that they want to use and they feel more invested in that, um, and it helps with buy-in. <clears throat> um, the other ca capability that I like to call it here is um, the capability to do real-time authorization. And there's um, multiple use cases here that are really, really um, important in e-commerce. You know, one being, you know, being able to authorize transactions over, say, a certain dollar amount. So you might say any transactions over $500, um, I'll send a real-time authorization straight to the um, customer's mobile device. They can authenticate that with a swipe or with their thumbprint. And then that gives you a record that um, the cu customer authenticated or, I mean, authorized that transaction um, so this helps stop um, first party fraud. Um, this is also another key use cases with um, you know offline workflows such as the call center. You can use this as a mode to either authenticate or authorize um, before you proceed with a call, um, especially if you're seeing some risk signals. Um, say they're wanting to change ship to address or something along those lines. Um, and then another kind of unique use, use case uh, that we see is uh, also authorizing um, packages to be left without a signature. So again, being able to stop some of that friendly fraud, um, you know, having that audit trail to say, yes, the customer did receive this transaction. So a um, couple of use cases that can be uh, handy there. Uh, again, in the handouts, we have a um, guide on multi-factor authentication. Um, so if you're interested in that, there's a link there. You can go and check that out. Uh, some of the benefits of um, MFA, you know, it's simplified, unified. So with mobile multi-factor, you can use um, the your customer's mobile device as the authenticator for any point of access. So it could, could be point of sale, it could be uh, in-app, mobile web, through the through your um, web interface, any point of access. And so that creates that consistent customer experience um, across all, all channels. Uh, it's secure by design, so it uses top grade cryptography. Um, I think the other thing um, that I feel like you can't underestimate here is the credential stores. So with mobile multi-factor, it uses what we call decentralized um, authentication. So that means that all the credential stores are on the user's phone. So you never end up with a central repository of um, login and passwords that you then have to protect. And then customizable for any app. So this is, it can be completely white labeled into your own native app, allowing you um, to preserve your own brand equity. Um, and, and you can set up some of those customizations for customers too, so you can gain, gain buy-in. All right, so just a, a few takeaways with combating uh, account takeover. Um, really the importance of looking at recognizing and uh, assessing risk. 
So being able to do that at a device level is a real advantage um, because of all of the personal data and credentials that have been breached in the last decade. Um, working with peers to stop known threats. So um, having that shared intelligence to be able to share across industries and geographies is definitely uh, a key um, advantage in fighting fraud. Uh, automated screenings. So, you know, having the right tools so that you can um, automate authentication, looking at, you know, those, those risk insights to drive decisions on when step ups are necessary. And then, you know, really giving customers the confidence to purchase. So, you know, if customers um, feel confident in your brand, that if they feel confident in your business that you're going to protect their identity, protect their um, transactions, you know, that takes friction out of the process and makes that easier to get those cart conversions. All right. So I think we're towards the end here. So I'll hand it over to Matt for any questions that came through. Cool. Thank you very much. Um, so first one we have here. So we've Device-based authentication, what happens if a user reports their device lost or stolen? That's a great question. So um, if a user reports their device lost or stolen, um, you can unregister that device. Um, so it makes it really easy, you know, and that, that's a use case too, like say if they get a new device, um, you can either set it up so that the user can uh, manage that on their account or you can do it um, on your side on the admin console. console. Um, but it allows you to update those devices, remove old devices or stolen devices. Cool, thank you. Uh, next one, does your authentication use any personal data? Um, so for our mobile multi-factor authentication, it does not use any personal data. And then for our device-based authentication, um, it's very minimal. So it's like IP address, which is um, under GDPR, that is defined as personal data, uh, indirectly identifying personal data. But really, we use the barest amount of personal data needed to authenticate users and provide that assurance. Perfect. Um, so how can you protect against um, ATO attacks aimed at call centers? That's a great question. I, I probably should have elaborated on that a little more. So um, really protecting at the call center, um, the best mode for that is uh, mobile mu multi-factor authentication. So uh, with that, what you can do is when um, a, a customer calls into your call center, you, know, you can have your agent push an authentication or authorization request directly to the user's mobile device, and then they can um, authenticate with whatever modes they've set up before the uh, agent proceeds with the call. I think we also have a case study on that with a UK insurer, and they changed their policy to kind of route through um, an online process. People had to pick up documents online so they could do a device check even when they're on a call. So it's definitely something to uh, think about when you think about call center fraud. Yeah, um, yeah. The, and I, I think that's the, you bring up a good point, Matt. You know, really thinking about, you know, individual business needs, there's a number of ways that you could solve that problem. Um, you could, I think a key with that too is that with the device-based authentication, um, you know, we saw that in that, that the one case study that we talked about with the social engineering fraud, where, you know, just being able to have that um, device based authentication reduces the number of um, resets that are needed and reduces that overall uh, volume to the call center in the first place. I agree. Uh, so last and final one, let's know pop some more questions in. Um, can Iovation layer authentication on top of existing authentication systems, or can you work with um, existing systems? Absolutely. So yeah, with um, device-based authentication that can be used uh, in conjunction with whatever type of authentication you're currently using. So um, the, it, that's how we generally see it used as a, a second factor of authentication. 
um, with our mobile multi-factor authentication launch key. Um, that can also be used in conjunction with um, other authentication systems, or it can be used as your, your primary um, mode of authentication. Okay, um, and we've had one last one sneak in. So what about where a customer does not have the device with them? What controls required for the fallback path? Um, yeah, if, if the customer doesn't have the device with them, um, you, you know, you would just need to set up an authentication flow. So um, you could provide a secondary method through your website or through the call center. So, you know, that's something that we could, you know, help you uh, customize within your own service. Cool. I think that brings the questions to the end. I mean, the only bit I would kind of stress here is that we, we keep seeing credential breaches every day. So um, in a world full of credentials and you can search them quite freely on the internet, device is definitely a key part to anyone's strategy looking to combat ATO. Um, but with that, I'll, I know Angie's got one more slide to share and I'll let you um, get through that and then we'll wrap things up. Absolutely, thank you. Um, so just wanted to let everybody know about uh, another webinar that we have coming up. This is with one of our partners, Chargebacks 911. And they're really going to be talking about, you know, um, how you can reduce chargebacks um, and combat uh, uh, those defenses within your own system. So I uh, thought this would be very pertinent for this audience. If you're uh, interested, you can go out to our, our website, um, search for webinars, and it's listed right out there. And maybe we provided a link. I'm not sure. We can include it in the email follow-up to everyone on the uh, webinar just to make sure that everyone's got it. Okay, great. Thank you, Matt. Perfect. No, thank you. And thank you for everyone joining us on the webinar today. Uh, just to recap, um, at the beginning of the webinar, we are going to send out the on-demand version of the presentation, links to the slides, as well as the handouts and um, the webinar mentioned here. Um, if you do have any additional questions, please get in touch with us. Um, you can do that at info at .com or reply to the email that we send out in the next few days. Um, but with that, I wish everyone a great rest of your day and we'll bring this webinar to a close. Thank you.